They don't occur in the same numbers as the mosses, but do in the same amount as in the lycopods. There are a wide variety of trees that grow in this northeastern coastal forest, for example this white birch, its bark being like strips of paper that can be peeled off. But it is not recommended, because to do such an action would endanger the trunk part of the tree, causing it to be more susceptible to disease and or insect attack. Its bark was in fact used for writing on hundreds of years ago, when there was not much availability of paper around at the time, and the bark was also used to make canoes by the Native Americans. Here a fir tree, being in the evergreen coniferous family of trees, is a food source for many animals that live in this forest such as moose, squirrel, and the chickadee bird. Its needles are also a food source for some species of moth and butterfly caterpillars. A very young eastern white pine attempting to grow as fast as possible toward the forest canopy for self-preservation with relentless competition from other trees within the forest, preferring a well-drained soil with a cool humid climate but also growing in boggy areas and rocky highlands. In a mixed growing of trees within this forest, this tree may dominate towering over all others, including the largest of the hardwood trees, providing food and shelter for birds and small mammals, with squirrels being the most numerous of of residents within this species of tree. Its needles contain five times more vitamin C than a lemon fruit. A mature tree can be up to 200 to 250 years old, some over 400 years. 500 years in age has also been recorded. Instances of tree competition can be noticed from time to time such as here. Again, relentless competition amongst trees attempting to make it to the top of the forest canopy to better aid themselves in taking in as much sunlight as possible to aid in their growth. Trees that don't make it to the top are smothered by other trees nearby by blocking the available sunlight and will eventually weaken and die. Specifically, the forest canopy is the plant community of the uppermost crown part of the trees. The above canopy provides shade down below from the hot summer sun, especially for animals with fur that can be more affected by the heat, but also can affect the amount of growth of vegetation, possibly leading to it being sparse underneath the canopy on the ground in some areas. The forest canopy can also be home to certain flora or fauna that are not found in the other layers of the forest as well. These oak trees, in which about 600 species of them exist, have leaves that are lobed at the margins. Oak trees are flowering plants. Its flowers bud out in the spring with its fruit in the form of a nut commonly known as an acorn, each containing one seed taking 16 to 18 months to mature, depending on which species it may be. If you look closely in the forest, you can see flat, matted in shape organisms that are attached to tree trunks. These are the lichens organisms that are a fungus but having algal cells within their tissues for photosynthesis to obtain energy from sunlight, known as a symbiotic relationship, where both organisms benefit from attached to one another, and in this case are completely obligated to one another for survival and cannot live without one another. Lichens also occur on leaves or branches, on stones or exposed soil surfaces, having the ability to occur in some of the most extreme environments. A dead pine tree hasn't completely fallen to the ground. It leans on its side providing a home to insects and other animals, showing signs of woodpecker activity in the past along its trunk. A spider's nest has been set up in one of the bored out holes. Spider's nests can be found anywhere in this forest where a spider has decided on a suitable location to make a home for catching insects. Man's past activity can be found here in this old rotting stump where the tree trunk has been sawn off, changing from a tree habitat to a moss habitat. But where there was once man's removal of trees, there's new life emerging. For example, baby trees that have taken root and sprouted. Here, a baby pine tree. And here, a baby maple tree. This black-capped chickadee is a small North American songbird, being the state bird of Maine and Massachusetts of the United States. It has the ability to lower its body temperature while resting on cold winter nights. 
It also has excellent memory to relocate its caches of stored food and is not too shy near humans having the boldness to feed from the hand. The black cap chickadee can be identified by having a black cap on its head and a chin with white sides on its face. It is found from coast to coast in the northern half of the United States and the southern half of Alaska and the southern edge of the Northwest Territories and Yukon in Canada. It may wander outside of this range in winter, preferring a deciduous carnivorous woods habitat. It can also be found in parks and in suburban areas. Caterpillars are the largest part of their diet in summer, hopping along tree branches searching for food at times hanging upside down. They also make short flights catching insects in the air. In the winter, seeds and berries are the bulk of their diet. Black-capped chickadees prefer to sleep in thick vegetation with their bill tucked under their shoulder. Their mode of flight is a slight undulation together with rapid wing beats, with a top speed of 13 miles per hour. Their vocalizations are highly complex. Thirteen types of vocalizations have been classified, many of which communicate with different types of information. It nests in trees 20 to 30 feet above ground. Nesting season is from late April to June. The nest being built by the female only, with a clutch of six to eight eggs, with the male bringing the female food that she feeds to her young. Young leave the nest 12 to 16 days after hatching. The young will feed from their parents for several weeks after leaving the nest, but are capable of catching their own food a week after. This nuthatch, characterized by a large head, a short tail, and a powerful bill and feet attached to this tree foraging for food, advertise their territory using loud and simple songs. Most breed in the temperate woodlands of the northern hemisphere. This species also nests in holes or crevices. Being non-migratory, they stay within their habitat year-round and are omnivorous. They pair for life. Its eggs are incubated 12 to 18 days, with both parents feeding the young. Like the chickadee, the nuthatch is also capable of lowering its body temperature while roosting to conserve energy. Caterpillars are numerous to say the least during the summer season and can consume a considerable amount of plant matter within their larval stage of their lives before they metamorphose into adult form. Caterpillars are the larval stage of the butterflies and moths. This one knows where it's going, up to where the leaves are to feed. Here, one is hanging upside down from a leaf, possibly getting ready to form a cocoon to metamorphose into an adult. Despite the negative publicity they get from us when it comes to plant destruction, on a positive note, they do come in many colorful forms. This caterpillar, known as the banded woolly bear, can be found in cold regions, all the way up to the Arctic. It emerges from its egg in the fall and overwinters in its caterpillar form, where it literally freezes solid. Its heart stops first, then its gut system, then its blood, along with the rest of its body. When spring arrives, it thaws out and is ready to metamorphose into an adult. Once that happens, as an adult, the moth has only days to find a mate before it dies. Lots of insects can care less to advertise themselves with bright colors for fear of being eaten. Upon a first glance from a distance of this tree trunk, you wouldn't notice anything upon it, but by taking a closer look, there is something there. A crane fly. In their larval form, they feed on grass roots. Here in the northern regions of the globe, it doesn't get very large as compared to tropical species that can grow to four inches in diameter. There are 4,250 species known. A ground hornet nest opening on the forest floor. Ground hornets are typically very aggressive in defending their nests, but when foraging for food they are almost docile. They will only sting when directly attacked. In protecting their nest, literally hundreds of individual wasps can be dispatched in a matter of seconds. And unlike bees, these insects can sting multiple times. They are so diligent about responding to any threat that even the ground vibrations from a lawnmower will produce a reaction. The life cycle of the ground hornet is annual. Only the queen survives winter. 
They burrow directly into the soil between the most massive roots and near the tree's trunk. The structure of the tree obviously provides added protection. Many insects within this forest do not just inhabit the land, but also inhabit the water as well. Here, water striders glide on the surface of the water in this small stream. The water strider's legs are long and slender, providing its weight to be distributed over a large surface area. Its legs are strong, having the flexibility that allows it to keep its weight evenly distributed, flowing with the water movement. Also inhabiting this stream are many frogs. Frogs have a wide distribution. They can be found from the tropics all the way to the subarctic regions of the world. Depending on the species, the tadpoles of frogs may be herbivorous, omnivorous, or plankton eaters in their diets. A much larger animal can be seen from time to time if you're ever lucky to run across one in and around this stream. And seen here are its tracks. They've been made by a white-tailed deer. A perfect spot to come down and get a quick drink when thirsty. Also, a raccoon has come down to this spot as well, either to drink, to wash its food, or both, as seen here in its tracks left in the sand. Besides what humans do from time to time, raccoons also wash their food before eating it. It's the end of August in this forest, and fall is just around the corner. This dead maple leaf seen here is a sign of things to come, and from there all of this forest will be locked in winter snow and ice. Another item that may seem just a tiny bit out of place on the forest floor is this shitted crow's feather, a sign that larger birds are here but way up high, forever watching for their next meal. A daddy long leg hangs from a plant. Although they may look like a spider, they are more closely related to mites. Here, a Japanese beetle feeding on a plant. With one beetle on the plant, more will soon follow, and not much in the way will be left of the plant's leaves by the time they're finished. This insect does a considerable damage to plants by consuming only the leaf material between the veins of the plants, and methods to halt their infestation across the eastern and midwestern part of the United States includes powders and pheromone traps. It's possible that the beetle larva entered the United States on some iris bulbs sometime before 1912. One insect that doesn't do much damage to a variety of plant species is the monarch butterfly caterpillar. It's relegated to one plant only, the milkweed plant, and since the milky sap is poisonous, the caterpillar as well is poisonous, giving it protection from predators, such as birds, being out in the open while feeding as seen here. As an adult, it is one of the few butterflies that migrate. This species in particular migrates all the way to Mexico, staying over winter, and returns in the spring. This species of milkweed plant is native to most of North America and east to the Rocky Mountains. The stem and all parts of the plants produce a white latex when broken. The seeds are attached to long, white, flossy hairs and encased in a large fruiting body. Failed attempts were made to try and obtain rubber from its milky sap and fiber from its seeds. Milkweed oil can be converted into cinnamic acid, a very strong sunscreen if used at 1-5% to 5 in concentration.